I remember it like yesterday when Matt came down the stairs and said so casually with a smile, I booked a one-way ticket to Santiago, Chile. I thought to myself, is this real? Can we really leave our amazing careers, friends, and family? Fast forward 10 months later after all the hard conversations, endless checklists, and heartfelt goodbyes, we were heading to the airport with one backpack each, about to set out for a multi-year adventure around the world. Filled with excitement, we had no idea what to expect, but we knew it would be a fun ride. Join us as we share what we are learning on our journey of a lifetime. This is Passport Joy Travel Talk with Nikki and Matt Javitt. Thank you so much for listening today, wherever you might be in the world. This is Matt Javitt alongside Nikki Javitt, and we are currently sitting in a tiny apartment in Krakow, Poland, where I'm super geeked up because we're going to a Pearl Jam concert tonight, and Pearl Jam is one of my favorite bands. We are a couple that's been traveling full-time for over 16 months now. It's crazy to say that. And we're documenting our journey on this podcast and our website, PassportJoy.com, in the hopes that we might be able to help other travelers uh, have an easier time with their getaways and week-long vacations or even long-term travel like we're doing. Because we've been fighting colds the last couple of weeks and haven't had a chance to get out as much as we like, that's one of the bad things about living in such close quarters with each other 24-7. I was sick, and then I gave it to Nikki, um, and now now she's working through it. We decided to focus on two topics that we've we talked about a little bit in previous episodes, but haven't had a chance to really dive into. Volunteering on the road as we travel, and the idea of voluntourism, as it's being called a lot on the internet, and workaways. Uh, that's where you, you're exchanging your time, effort, and energy for free stays and food through their website. If you're just getting caught up with the podcast to date, check out the Journey So Far tab at PassportJoy.com. You click on a tab, it takes you through the everything that we've experienced so far from the time we left in February 2017 up to the present time. It, it kind of takes you through all the different cities and places as we approach almost 30 countries visited now. It takes you through that whole the whole range of, of things that we've experienced and also has great links within the, the blog if there's something that interests you, whether it's India or Albania or some of the places we visited. So check that out. And if you in case you break away before I recap in the end, please remember to sign up for our newsletter at PassportJoy.com. We send out weekly highlights on Thursdays of everything that we did the week prior, all the cool stuff that's going on in our lives, and then all the also the stuff that we're looking ahead for uh, in the future. Um, it's a chance to kind of read about the highlights and stuff that we don't cover in the podcast, but an interesting things that we find on the internet, whether it has to do with travel or with our lives, and it kind of we just kind of send that out there and, and get it to the folks that are following along. All right, let's let's jump into this episode. attempt to tackle a kind of difficult and complex subject, but one that has come up often, not only as we travel, but from information that's been shared with me from friends and family back home and uh, just kind of something that's near and dear to our heart and something that's real important as we set out to do this journey, the idea of giving back. And now it's it's a hot travel topic. It's called voluntourism and the idea that people are, are traveling a great deal to give back. As they make their adventures around the world, they also give back in that week or two that they're spending in um, different parts of the globe. So we just want to talk about this, attempt to do our best, my best chance to talk about a complex subject. And it's it's one that's emotional, too, because people, they spend so much time, effort, energy, money into their volunteer efforts that they get barely emotionally tied to it. So when you when you discuss it, it can create a little bit of fire. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to, trying to talk about something that's come up often with us on the road and then give our perspective on it. And then hopefully uh, maybe I'll start a conversation of sorts. Just to give some background on my volunteering efforts so you get a sense of the context of my point of view. Prior to leaving our adventure, um, I was involved in several organizations that were important to me from a financially focused standpoint. Nikki and I hosted an annual fundraiser for type one diabetes uh, for 10 years that ended up raising about $50,000 over the years. A lot of time and effort went into building out the event, but in the end, it was mostly um, creating awareness 
for type 1 diabetes and financial support for the cause. Nikki had efforts in the past with working with the education process with parents of T1D children. But when it came to our fundraiser, it was mostly around just creating that awareness, working with local organizations to donate gifts, and then the end having a large group of amazing people that donated their money to the cause, which was fantastic. So that was that effort. From a time perspective, I was deeply involved in a developing neighborhood in our hometown of, of Indianapolis, Indiana, through the partnership of our church. I worked closely with the school there that has over a 95% poverty rate for its students. I tutored a boy from the age of four. He, Anthony, is now 14 and um, we're still very close to this to this point. And I would go over to the school weekly to work with him about an hour every week over all those years. Became very close. He has a twin sister, Nancy. I've grown, uh, Nikki and I have grown close with her as well, along with the entire family. Both parents are very present and um, they have two other siblings. And through the process over the years, we spent many hours, particularly with Anthony and Nancy, going to sporting events, hanging out at the park, taking them to bookstores, just doing a, doing a lot of things with them. And uh, we were even at the wedding of their parents. And uh, we've shared many holidays with them, eating meals with them, and um, just sharing time with them and, and watching them grow as, as the years have passed. Beyond this family, I've been on several committees to raise money and awareness for that for this mostly Hispanic community on Indianapolis's west side. Uh, We've helped with health fairs, backpack drives, done many, uh, organized many fish fries, cooked meals for the people in that neighborhood and um, bought sporting equipment. And I've also even put on like basketball clinics to teach them basic skills, teach the kids skills and stuff in that neighborhood. So when we were, when we were setting out on our journey around the world, I knew that there would be a void in volunteering, um, not only because I'd, I'd miss Anthony and Nancy so much, but just having that weekly interaction with them and their classmates at the school. I just knew that they, they would, we want to give back in some way as we traveled. But that being said, it's a very complex when attempting to give back, not only at home, but when traveling. Like I said before, volunteerism, it's a term used to describe short-term volunteering completed by foreigners. And in many cases, the volunteers don't even have to have any skills. There's many books and articles on this subject, but I'm going to attempt to describe what we've done and then kind of create our point of view on what we're trying to complete, just so you can see our thought process and and how we're going about it. So we were, as we've traveled, we started our our journey in South America. And while we were in Ayacucho, Peru, about a month prior or so, I reached out to a Chicago-based leader who is um, has created a foundation that works with the young women of this town of Ayacucho. Nikki and I knew we were going to be there for about 10 days during Easter. And it was, a, it was a way for us to make a connection before we reached the city, but then also help and give back while we were there. This lady out of Chicago, she's a lawyer out of Chicago. She had spent time there, I believe in college. And she, through that process, she built up this organization over the years. So we had a chance to kind of be a an in-between for her and meet with her local head of staff for the organization that essentially their idea is they they get these girls out of the orphanage process and then help build them into leaders that get into college. And then in that process, they raise money to give back to these girls, uh, to give to these girls so they can create, they can build better skills and then they can have potential to make more of their life with the addition of education. So as Nikki and I had a chance to go down there and meet with the local leader, she was amazing to be able to hear all the things that she did on a regular basis um, for these young girls and as a connection point for the, the lady out of Chicago. And it was cool because I think that the, the local lady had a chance to really kind of brag to us, knowing that we were going to be a voice back to Chicago saying, hey, everything is wonderful here. And man, the details that this lady put into it to make sure that her organization was in just providing everything they could for these for these young ladies there and the examples they had to show that it works the program works what they're doing works and we even had a chance to um, meet two of the girls that have gone through the program and then are doing great things so that whole process was wonderful and not only did a chance to give us a voice of hey what you're putting on here is working we wrote a blog post about it and then we had a chance to share it so then she could give the people that she's influencing to continue to donate a, more of a reason to continue to donate more or even even grow the sponsorships in a way. And through that process, the orphanage that 
she was working with that these that these young girls were coming through, Nikki and I reached out to them and said, essentially, what else do you need while we're here? What could we provide that, that you need? And on the top of the list was expensive baby formula. It's one of those things that you just don't really think about, but that because they had small children in this orphanage as well, that was one of the key things they needed, along with games and, and, and fun things for the children. But baby formula was the key. So um, Nikki and I went out um, in a town, got this stuff, and we we took it over to the orphanage. And it was one of those things where they were well, extremely well organized. They didn't need volunteers. And they they kind of told us that in the kindest way possible that you that we don't really need you involved in any way as we attempted to volunteer our time. And we said, okay, that's we understand that's okay. And we gave them these items. In that process, though, it was kind of fun. We I'm a big sports guy. I love sports. So the, the chance to give a lot of sports equipment to the kids and then just to see their reaction of getting basketballs and, and soccer's soccer balls that was that was fun uh, it was a fun event for Nikki and I but it also was a chance to to see the reactions of the kids and, and how happy they were to receive these balls. And then we had a chance to play for an hour or so with the kids. And, and that was neat. But in the end, it was essentially the financial support of, of some of these items rather than the time. Fast forwarding to uh, Kerala, India, we had a similar situation where I found a local orphanage. I reached out beforehand. We were there for, we we're going to be in Kerala for about uh, two and a half, three weeks. So I reached out and organized a chance to visit the orphanage, Nikki and I, and just asked again to the head priest of the organization, what did they need? What items were they would be best for the children to have? And again, it's it's not what you might think, or it, it might be what you think. They wanted toothpaste and soap and shampoo and, and hair oil and notepads and school equipment for the kids. And they gave they gave us a very detailed list, which was wonderful. And um, Nikki and I went out and purchased those items. And then, but we also we added some sporting equipment like basketballs and soccer balls and some cricket because cricket's huge in India. Some cooking equipment, and we brought that over with us. And it was amazing. We took an Uber over there to the facility. And as we arrived, there was nobody outside. Uh, so to set the scene a little bit, you go through the gates, you pull up uh, to a, a large, it looks like a dormitory, almost like a university campus building where you can see that there's classrooms and schooling inside of it, but there's also dormitories. Cause Nikki and I had a chance to, um, the gentleman took us around and showed us the entire facility. And we had a chance to see like the, the kitchen hall where the kids ate and the, the school classrooms and the dormitories where they slept. And there's about 55 kids children that, that stayed here, boys, in this facility. And as we pulled in through the gates and we began to pull out, we parked the car and we opened the trunk, we began to pull out not only the the goods, the soap and shampoo and, and give those items to, to some of the volunteers there and they put them back in a, in a separate room. We pulled out some of the basketballs and soccer balls. And I asked the head priest, I said, Hey, do you mind if I, and it's, at this point, the kids started coming out of the woodwork. I mean, they from all, all areas of the, of the school area. And oh, by the way, so there's a soccer field right in front of the, what I just described as this big building. And there's also a basketball court, a concrete basketball court with, with two hoops. And there's also a patch of just, just grass area. And as we start to pull out this equipment, the kids start coming out of everywhere. So I just asked the priest, hey, could you mind if I start throwing these, um, these balls to the kids? And he said, yeah, for sure. So I just start tossing these balls to these kids and then they just multiplied. And before you know it, within probably four or five minutes, all 55 children are out in these courtyards playing sports with these balls and just having a blast. Not a single one of them had shoes on, um, which is uh, uh, still difficult to even think about and see, but um, because they just don't, they just don't have, I think it's partly, it's, it's twofold. I guess that they, they don't have the proper shoes, but I think it's also probably a culture thing as well. But to just see these kids like playing hoops with no, sh- I mean, playing basketball at a very fast speed, kind of playing with them for a little while with no shoes on was, was kind of eye opening and, and, uh, it was tough to see, but that was, that was amazing. So we had a chance to spend about two and a half, three hours only getting the tour, hanging out with the kids and um, seeing the the positive effect that sports has on children. Cause they were all really good at sports and they, they do play. It wasn't like the first, this was the first time they got sporting equipment, but it was cool that they got new sports equipment. So that was a lot of fun. And that was a blast for uh, Nikki and I, and, the, and we felt like the kids got a lot out of that. And then um, another connection I made was in George, South Africa. I made a connection with a local organization that helps bring kids out of the townships. Now, townships in South Africa would be considered uh, like an American ghetto, like the lowest poverty comes from the townships because after apartheid, there was a lot of separation and segregation. And um, a lot of the 
extremely poor are still in these townships. I had a chance to go visit the townships while I was there with this organization. And uh, it, it is, it's extremely tough to see this level of poverty. Unless you're there, it's, it's almost impossible for me to describe, but it is what it's, it's just difficult. I, I don't even want to really put it into words because of how hard it is to describe, but it's, it's extremely poor. But through this organization, they, it's awesome because they actually have tryouts for the kids to try out for their sport program that also helps them become better leaders, educates them better, teaches them life skills, and then learns more about faith. But because they have to try out, they get the best athletes from the township that then, then end up getting on soccer teams that compete locally, but also have a chance to go to Northern Ireland um, once every two years because the program is led by um, several people from Northern Ireland. And through that process, I had a chance to not only do we get the, to meet with the leadership a couple of times, understand about their message. Nikki and I had a chance to hang out with these young, their young adults there between ninth and 12th grade. And then also some of the kids that have gone through the program, because this is a mature program at this point, it's about 10 years old. They've created leaders that are now leaders within the program. So to be able to see that, see that interaction with the kids and to see them growing leaders uh, was, was fantastic. And then we also, again, just around the similar theme, we, we purchased equipment for the kids, in this case, soccer balls, with the idea that these kids we gave the soccer balls to these leaders in this program that those kids would take those soccer balls and give them to kids in their communities with the messaging basically that the giving message of so much has been given to these kids through this program that they could now give these soccer balls back to other children that are that look up to them in their communities because they are the star athletes and then hopefully that giving message uh, multiplies and then the hope is in not only that process but we also I've been attempting to get out the message of this soccer organization to other U.S. based programs that are looking to partner with them in some capacity because uh, they're what they're doing with Northern Ireland in the traveling to Northern Ireland to compete with those teams. They're hoping to do something similar to U.S. based teams. So I'm attempting to get that message out for them in the hopes that in the future they can grow the program even further, both financially and just from partnerships around the world and then continue to get their message out. Um, this program's grown, grown so much that they're actually building a school in 2019 to help these kids in this high school phase to, to get better educated. So as you see, we, we've had a chance to do really cool efforts during our travels. Um, these are just a highlight of, of several that we've done as well. But we've done some creative things there, but it's also very difficult to understand like what is really helping. Like when you leave in your heart, you th you're hoping that what you're doing is worth the time and you're not hindering or, or hurting them in any way because you just don't know if by popping in and out of these children's lives, is that a bad thing or is that a good thing? When these kids they see your face for a short period of time. Is that building them up or is that hurting them in some way? I've been exposed to two books on this subject, uh, Toxic Charity and When Helping Hurts. Um, I actually read these books prior to leaving our travels and while I was volunteering in the States. And it was a lot of things that I took and I tried to implement into how I was handling the children that I was working with in Indianapolis. And it's difficult, man. There's such a thin line between when you're trying to do what you think is right. And if what you think is helping people might not actually be helping them. And in a lot of ways, and these books highlight it is the idea that you could be hurting them and taking away from their dignity at some point. I've been part of programs that give a lot of gifts to families during Christmas, right? So you show up with these gifts and you've seen in situations where if there is a male adult present that they might even leave the room when this is going on because the idea that you could be actually hurting their dignity by the fact that you're coming from the outside giving gifts to their children, but is it something that this male adult could not provide in some way? So it's it's these things that are really difficult, really hard. And you, it's it's they're complex, and they're things that we think about often because you just you want to do the right thing, you want to do what your heart's telling you to do, but you want to do it in a positive way. So, and it's a lot of it is around the idea of of as you're giving, keeping in mind like the whole idea of give a man a fish you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for life. And it's like, how do we, how do you do that? Especially when you're traveling and you, and you can only spend time with somebody for a week or, or two weeks, how much change can you really, really make? But I'm on the side that 
I think it's positive. There's a lot of things out there that talk about volunteerism is negative and you can be hurting these communities. And there's even books out there. There's articles written about these children, that the, these children, these orphanage are actually for-profit organizations and that they're recruiting these kids from nearby, nearby cities and towns to live in these orphanages because as the orphanage numbers go up, they can actually increase the number of people that are visiting and then they get more donations and it's just a cycle. But I think if, if you, if if you do the, the research ahead, you understand, you can do your best what, to figure out what organizations are doing the right things. And you, you kind of stick with your gut and you kind of figure out which charitable programs that are actually empowering rather than creating dependencies for the communities. Then that's, that's where you can begin to see that what you're doing is, is the right cause. It's difficult because we're all very busy right? And we want to give. And sometimes just writing a check is the easiest way and not getting involved. And so then when you want to get involved, you're like, okay, you get perspective what you think they need, but you don't really understand what the needy want. As travelers, we sometimes think that people are living without, but in reality, they're actually living very full lives. They don't want or need some of the things that we think we might need or want for a full life, but in reality, they have completely full lives. So it's a tough line when you're trying to give in different cultures and different areas around the world, because you really don't understand what they, what they want or what they need in their life. So we just got to be cautious about that. And the complexities of this are coming even in the smallest ways. Nikki and I were in an Uber recently when our driver, he was complaining about how the tourists were giving the local beggars money and it was creating a cycle of growth of begging in his population. And he was talking about that these people were capable of working, but because the travelers kept donating the money, it gave them an easier lifestyle, these beggars. And he said it was kind of creating a fraction within a city. So these, like I said, these are difficult, man. These, I, these are hard things. We want. I wanted to talk about them because I've had articles sent to me, and I take all of it fully aware. And I'm going to attach these articles in the show notes in these books. But I guess to just kind of the wrap up, do the best you can. Listen to your heart and gut. Do the right thing. Research your tail off if you can before donating your time or money or energy to some of these organizations. But in the end, if you think that you can help people grow a better life in some capacity, then I can continue to continue to do it. And I encourage you to do it. And it is a great way to see the world. If you're going to go to these places around the world and give your time and effort and energy to hopefully build up their community, you take your skills and you put it in that community and hopefully you can teach somebody in that community to get better in whatever you're really good at. That's a great way to spread your I guess, spread your love in in different areas. But um, I think just keep some of these negative possibilities in mind as well as you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. We talk about it often, but we absolutely love Airbnb and the opportunities it's given us around the world to have unique stays, stay with amazing hosts, and get the inside scoop on local activities. It's been a really cool way to meet people around the world. We've stayed with former surf pros in South Africa, a five-star chef in Peru, and a wine producer in the hills of Northern Italy. You can choose to stay with somebody in their home while they're there, or you can rent out the entire place by yourself. Um, It's also a great way for those large family getaways when you don't want to separate the family in multiple hotel rooms, but you can have the entire house to yourself in a, in a huge, sometimes even in mansions. So please check out passportjoy.com forward slash stay. Again, passportjoy.com forward slash stay for an up to free $40 credit on your first booking with Airbnb. And not only just staying around the world, but you might want to host out your home as well. It's been a great way for people to make money on the side and maybe even create your own travel fund, as we have heard on the road that people do, that gives them a chance to, to travel on their own if they just host a family or two, maybe once or twice a month. So consider that. When we were looking to travel, obviously clothing was a big deal. What, what clothes would we bring? I mean, I, I struggled with my pants for a while because because I'm a bigger guy, it takes up so much of your bag. But I ended up finding Mizman and Maine pants. Again, Mizzen and Maine pants. And yes, they are a little bit more expensive, but the cost is worth it now that I've been on the road because they're wrinkle-free, they're extremely comfortable, 
very easy to take care of, light in the bag, which was a big deal, extremely light in the bag. They're stretchy and they're versatile. So I've worn, you can wear them to church, you can wear them for nights out. I've hiked with them up Machu Picchu and my other heights, hikes because I brought no other pants except my mizzen and mains and two pair. And they're versatile with the, the shirts I've worn, the shirts I chose as well. And I'm extremely happy with these pants. Go to PassportJoy.com forward slash pants to get $25 off your first order. Again, PassportJoy.com forward slash pants to get your $25 off your order. And also check out our tools page that talks about all the things that we use on our travels at PassportJoy.com forward slash tools for other deals. This segment is on workaways. We've talked about workaways several times on the podcast so far and in our blog posts, but we're going to dedicate a, a full segment on it now. Um, we've done four of these so far Antifagasta Chile or Chile, as they say there, Guayaquil, Ecuador, Perdica, Greece, which is an island uh, in Greece, and Victoria Bay, South Africa. So we're going to talk about kind of the advantages and disadvantages of volunteering in this way. Okay, so for for those of you who don't know exactly what Workaway is, it is an international online company that was set up to promote a fair exchange between travelers willing to work as volunteers and hosts that are willing to help with their businesses and projects and activities and basically host you as a volunteer at their place in free exchange for either a place to stay or food, et cetera. So the work awares or volunteers are expected to work this pre-agreed upon amount of time per day or week. And you arrange this through the WorkAway website. And how that's done is, is you just pay an annual membership fee and you can do it as a single account if you're just a traveler that's traveling by themselves, or you can do it as a couple account. And that's what Matt and I do. And you just pay a one-time annual fee and you create sort of like an online profile for yourselves as you would for like a Facebook profile. You can upload pictures of yourself doing other work away things. You can upload pictures of yourself from your previous travels and just a little, you know, background information on who you are, what you like to do and just your interests. And then through this website, you're able to search the locations that you want to go to and current postings or listings that are available for you to go to and volunteer your time and see where you can take yourself and go on your next adventure and meet new people, et cetera. And there'll be like an online description of what the place will have to offer, what type of accommodations that they will provide for you, what type of housing, what your work hours are supposed to be like, what the job duties are supposed to be or what they're supposed to consist of and and things like that. So essentially what it is, is, is you're volunteering your time or your skills in exchange for housing and other perks like food, internet, transportation. And it's just a really neat way to meet people and learn new things about different cultures and places. So along with all of this, and like Matt just said, we've done four. A couple of them were only a couple of weeks, but we did do two of them. One was in Greece, on an island in Greece, and that was for an entire month. And then one was in South Africa. It was called Victoria Bay. That was another one that we did for an entire month. Along with doing volunteer work like this, obviously there's, there's the good and the bad of it. So we kind of just wanted to have an open discussion for, you know, things that we've experienced while we've done this. And just so everybody was aware of the program itself and what you can gain from it and things to kind of like watch out for. So the good things that we have experienced in doing things for work away would be first and foremost, while we, why we do it is just to meet people in general and, and make new friends. And when I say this, I truly mean it really, you know, a lot of people do do this because you do get free housing 
And that's a great perk. I mean, it does keep our monthly costs down, but we have met some truly great people along the way. And whether it be guests that are staying at the actual places that we're working at or just actual other work aware's who are doing the same similar things that we're doing while we are there. We've just met some awesome people and we've remained in contact with them via, you know, text or Instagram or Facebook and we've actually um, stayed with them after our work away experience. So we met a cool couple in Greece when we were working in Perdica and they live in Munich, Germany. And we just spent about a week with them in Munich. And it was just so cool to do that. And, you know, to be able to say, Hey, we actually met you. They were, they were paying customers at the hotel, the boutique hotel that we were working at through work away. And we just hit it off with them, had a great dinner with them. And, you know, fast forward about a year later, we're in Munich, Germany with them hanging out. So, you know, lifelong friends and great friendships made. Um, Another thing is great about the program is, is obviously you're going to be subjected to a different culture and a different country. And so people are going to speak different languages. So whether you know that language or not, you might pick up a, a different language, learn a couple new words, or work on some language skills that you might already have. So like in South America, when we were in Chile, we really got to work on our Spanish speaking skills. And that was great. Another thing is, is you can obviously learn new skills. So, you know, we worked at a surf lodge and although we didn't necessarily partake in that, but if you, if you wanted to, they offered, they had surf lessons where you could sign up and just call this number. And there's this guy called surf Ben where he was, literally probably a two minute drive away and you could rent surfboards from him. So every day there was an opportunity for us to go surfing if we would have liked to. And, you know, we've worked in um, now four uh, hotels or bed and breakfasts. So we really have got to learn about just the hotel business or hostel business and B&B business in general. And it's just something that we were never really exposed to before. So learning new skills is a bonus. Just immersing yourself completely into a new culture. So, I mean, these are maybe places that we would not have visited otherwise, or maybe not been able to afford. So some places, a lot of times people will choose like a very expensive place on work away to visit like a super expensive city like Zurich or Copenhagen. And you can find a place like that, that would give you a place, a free place to stay and you can volunteer your time. And now you're staying in a place that's costs you nothing. And when you're done volunteering, you can then go out in the city and explore and see all of the things and sites that the city still has to offer while you don't have to pay for a place to stay. Yeah. And part of that exploration phase, when you get a chance to meet people that are there, the locals, especially, they give you the chance to really understand the ins and outs of the city. And they'll, because they live there all the time, they can give you great advice on the things that they think you should do, like a local would do, rather than if you were just a typical tourist going off a hot list. So that's that's a, a true bonus of the situation as well. Another great thing that you get to do, just uh, piggybacking off of meeting other people, is we've gotten to go on some amazing day trips with other travelers in our spare time. So while you're not volunteering, you know, you obviously have time off. So we've done some great trekking along the coast when we were in Victoria Bay with our newfound friends and we went to a lot of Saturday farmers markets too. And it's just a, a great way to like meet people and, you know, just do new things with your new friends that you have. And we went dancing that one night in uh, Chile. Uh, the the host at our bed and breakfast took us out dancing one night and it was a blast. Yeah. Our experience in Antofagasta, Chile was amazing. Like she did so many social events. So she took us to this nightclub and she was like, let's go to this discoteca and go like salsa dancing. So we did that. And then she also had like football games. So football games were on TV. And so she would host these Chilean barbecue nights over at her hostel that we were working at. And she would probably have a group of five to 10 of her friends and she would barbecue all of these meats and stuff. And she would just have this huge, amazing food spread out. So her friends would come over. We got to meet new friends. We had watched the football game on TV and just kind of chill out and hang out with a whole nother group of friends that we would not, you know, meet otherwise um, outside of working in the hostel that we were volunteering at. And it was just a great way to meet other, you know, just other people. And then in addition to that, when we were in Greece, Our host in Greece, she was super nice. I think it was maybe like the third night that we were there. She 
invited us to one of her favorite restaurants on the island. And so we were able to go out with her that night and have dinner and drink wine and, you know, overlook the med while we were sitting there. So that was pretty cool. She also taught me that the black, what name, black orchid, oh, urchin, sea urchin. black, black sea urchin. So when you're in um, Greece, as you look around the coast, there's these little black dots that kind of just, they, this with spikes that are all on the coastline and they're, they're very intimidating, but she taught me that they're actually a delicatessen in Perdica and the people would get them still alive. I'm actually held one in my hand and as they're alive, you can kind of gut them and eat the insides of it um, as you would like a, uh, as a, like a clam or a snail or something. But um, so I had to, had the opportunity to eat that. And I would never have done that um, without her coaching. Cause I'd be so scared to pick up one of these black sea urchins. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. I mean, she would get up at the crack of dawn and go swimming every morning and come back with like fresh seafood that she caught herself. Like, I don't even know how she did it, but she did. But yeah, so it's just really cool experiences like that. Things that you probably would have not done by yourself. And yeah, I mean, other things like in addition to learning new skills. So, I mean, just just discovering the unexpected value of even your own talent. So Matt, before he worked in IT and a lot of people, once they figured that out, you know, just through discussions of us volunteering, I mean, we may have been there to help clean or to check customers in or help with receptions or just guest relations in general, but just through conversations, simple conversations, Matt would say, Hey, I mean, if you need me to help you with your web design or help you revamp your Airbnb listings. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm here to volunteer and there's some downtime, so I'll go ahead and do that. So, I mean, it was just really cool to be able to help people that way and, you know, just find yourself useful in other ways than what they thought they needed you for to begin with. But yeah, and when it really came down to it for me, what I really pulled out of all of my experiences was that I thought it was pretty cool just to experience life in someone else's shoes for a bit. I mean, I've never been a maid. I've never worked at a a hotel reception desk or, you know, been someone's liaison for trying to arrange social events. And so in the end, you know, what I did before I left on our travel adventure was I was a clinical pharmacist and that was my thing. So I've been able to just experience the world through someone else's eyes and different capacities. And I just really, really, Really think that that's a neat thing to do for a change. It's just refreshing. Yeah, it can be, some of it can be extremely humbling work carrying, I can remember carrying a mattress or carrying mattresses up three flights of stairs in Greece over and over as it's like 95 degrees outside and uh, sweating like crazy. It, it's extremely humbling and it's a lot of it can be hard work um, if you decide. And But I had a chance to meet one of the stars from Narcos season three when we were in Waikil, Ecuador, because he was there putting on a, a play production in the Airbnb that doubled as a theater in that town. So that was amazing. And those are some of the experiences that I'll always um, cherish as we as we go through our, our journey around the world. And, and it's pretty cool. Do you want to get in like the different skill, like the different skills that obviously we focused on the bed and breakfast aspect, cleaning and, and but talk about some of the other stuff that's that's on the website. Yeah. So the website's really cool, easily navigatable. So essentially what you do is, is you can research by the country that you would like to go to and or continent. I mean, it really, it's really, you can get very granular with it, but so let's just say, for example, that you want to go to Europe. So then you can choose Europe and then you can choose the country that you want to go to. So let's say you want to go to Greece and then narrow it down that way. And then the way I use the website is, is there's like a more option. Then I search by the work away it place itself is it willing to accept two or more workers. And so I do that because it's always going to be Matt and I, it's not just going to be me as a single person. And then I do search for things such as that they will be offering internet. And that's really my only two search things or filters, I should say that I put on there. And then I do also put now, um, after having done four of them, um, when I do look, I do click the box with feedback. And all that essentially means is, is that people have done the workaways before, they have commentary on it, and you can really see if it's a good workaway to work at, and you can get feedback from other workawayers who have done it. So you can really just get kind of a feel for, is this a good workaway to work at? What's the work like? I mean, people are brutally honest on this website. So I do click the, the, with feedback on there. And those are my three filters I use. And then 
the skill sets are just arranged from, you can imagine from A to Z. So you can put on there that you want to do. If you're a yoga instructor, you can work at places that are looking for yoga instructors. If you're musically talented, then there are places that are searching for musicians. There's anything from cafes to like restaurants to even bed and breakfasts who have like an entertainment, you know, gig that might be going on at night. So if you can play the guitar, they may need someone to just do like a bit every night for two or three hours, maybe five days a week or something, or maybe concentrate it more on the weekends. There's also things like if you are a kid lover, so they have au pair positions and nanny positions. They have English translating positions. And and it's funny too, because I used to be very intimidated by that. I'm more of the person that leans towards, well, I'm not an expert in that field, so I would never sign up for, I'm going to be an English translator for any type of language. And When you really delve into it and read these descriptions, what they'll say is, is I just need you to sit there and talk to my child in English for two to three hours a day. And I find that very interesting because that's just how their child's going to learn. They say you don't have to have any sort of, you know, formal training or you don't even have to know their native language. So you could be going to Germany, speaking to a German child and the child knows a little bit of English and they just want you to have conversation or read to their child in English. So there's so many things that you can do. And like I said, we've done the majority of working in hostels and hotels. And the reason that we've done those is because I felt most comfortable doing that. And I felt that we would meet the most people, like-minded people like us traveling. And there would be a lot of people at the places that we were doing that way. Instead of like isolating ourselves to like one family and staying with a family with children is really the only reason we didn't do those yet. Yeah. And there's, there's physical labor ones as well. If that's more, if you're, if you feel like you're not as social as, uh, as Nikki and I are, there's physical, yeah, there's physical labor. There's, there's construction stuff. There's, we had one friend that picked grapes at a, at a vineyard. We had one friend that she did an effort where she was on a yacht with a guy for a week and essentially was his helping hand on the yacht. And whenever they would, um, she would cook. And then whenever they would port, she would run errands for him, pick up groceries and come back and do all that. So it is such a wide range and it's so eye opening on the opportunities that are out there. If you're looking to travel the world and, and, and save money on your budget, it is a great way to do it and a great way to meet a lot of people. And it's, it's a lot of fun, but there are some negatives. So now Nikki's going to get into some of the things you got to be aware of as you're looking at the website and uh, because it's not all rosy all the time. Yeah. And like, honestly, we tend to shy away from negative topics on our podcast and things like that, but we do want to keep it real. And, (laughs) and I'm only saying this because if anyone is contemplating working or volunteering for a work away, I would say definitely do it. It's, you're going to meet a lot of people. And again, like I said, the bonus is, is you're able to make your dollar last longer um, or whatever currency you, you may be um, going on, but you do get to meet a lot of people. You get to do a lot of things that you may not have or experience a lot of things that you may not have otherwise experienced. But like Matt said, it's not always peaches and cream. So things that I have just come across in doing some work aways is, is that, you know, like Matt said, it's very humbling and there's a lot of things that we have done. And like I said, full disclosure, you have the ability to choose. So we chose to work at hostels. We chose to work at bed and breakfasts and in hotels. So we knew what we were getting into, you know, with the job descriptions, they're out there minus a couple of them. They'll say, you don't have to clean. And then you end up going there and they, that you're cleaning the entire time. So, I mean, we have scrub toilets and we've cleaned up dog poop and baboon poop when we were in Africa. When we were in Africa, there were these um, monkeys that would, or baboons, I should say, that would break into a property on the regular. And when they would, they would raid the kitchen and eat all the food and then they would poop on the floor. And I mean, we are the volunteers, so we would have to pick up baboon poop. And, you know, when I read the job description or the volunteer description, that wasn't in the volunteer description. I mean, yes, there was an occasional if it is necessary and we our cleaning crew is not here, you may have to turn over a room and I'm fine with that. But I never thought in my wildest of dreams, I'd be cleaning baboon poop off the floor. And so, I mean, I just thought at first it was hilarious. But after doing it five or six times, you're like, no, this isn't funny anymore. I mean, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details of like how disgusting people can be because you think about it, but just cleaning bathrooms in general can get very gross. So that kind of stuff, 
I've worked in customer service for a very long time. I used to work as a pharmacist for a retail pharmacy and, you know, just dealing with upset customers. And especially when you don't really know the ropes of the whole, I guess, business and you've been thrown into something or you're not very acclimated to the culture and you have a customer that's either talking to you in a foreign language or upset about something that you really have no um, say over or you you may not even know who's in charge or what the proper protocol is. I mean, I have not ever read a policies and procedures manual on any place that I've ever started working at. And to piggyback off that, I mean, training is almost comical. I mean, training that we've probably received at all of the places that we've worked at has been very, I'll say, little. And it's it's almost kind of a joke, but I don't know. I mean, some people may prefer that. I'm very type A and I like to see a manual. I want to know what do I do if this happened, et cetera. So, you know, when you have an upset customer yelling at you because they've booked a room for their family of four and they're asking you where are the guardrails for my child and my two-year-old can't sleep in this bunk bed because they're going to fall out and break their arm. And then you're supposed to find guardrails that don't exist at 10 PM in the middle of the night. And there's no other hotel rooms left. I mean, what do you do for a customer like that? You know, and then you can't, find the boss and everybody's sleeping and you know it's just situations like that you that you have to deal with but again it's customer service so you just try to put on your smiling face and try to figure out like the best solution and so yeah you know being thrown in situations like that you know you're also going to be treated poorly and felt disrespected and unappreciated sometimes whether it be by the people that you're volunteering for or by the customers that you're dealing with and a lot of times, you know, you find yourself saying like, this isn't something that I really need to do to travel the world. This is something that I want to do because I'm trying to meet new people. And, you know, that can get very frustrating at times. But, you know, you just always kind of tell yourself, I'm trying to remind myself like that I'm very blessed to be doing this and it'll pass. So things like that. But at the end of the day, like what I really feel like is, is that some of our greatest friends we've met doing this, like I said, and whether it be volunteers or customers, and we became really good friends with them. And it's just work away in general is such a good experience. And you can meet great people and you just have such great opportunities. And without being too negative about it, I don't know. I mean, I think if you find something and you go on the website and it's within your wheelhouse and it sparks an interest, I I think that maybe you should try it just because it provides a great opportunity for you to be able to travel the world and, and, you know, to obviously to live for free for a, a certain amount of time that you agree upon. And that is it for this episode. Thank you so much again for listening. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. This really helps Nikki and I get in front of new travel listeners that might not be aware of our story. And also thank you so much for leaving great reviews like this one left on Apple Podcast. I've been following Matt and Nikki on Facebook ever since they started living out of their backpack and traveling the world. What fun it has been to follow along with them. And I'm, I'm excited to tune in to their podcast for even more fun. Thank you so much for those kind words. We really enjoy hearing that feedback and we appreciate you taking the time to write it. As always, I list out all the important links that we talked about in today's show notes at passportjoy.com under the podcast tab under the episode listing. So for instance, the books we talked about that have to do with um, toxic charity and giving and that in that regard and a couple of articles that we found on the subject and also work away and some advice there. Uh, there's links there that you can follow along. You can also follow with our weekly newsletter that comes out on Thursdays by signing up at passportjoy.com. Um, simply just put on your email address at the tab there and you can get all the latest blog posts, travel tips and tools and our social media links at the the website. We will be back with you next week for a new episode. Until then, safe travels to wherever you might be heading out to next. Bim, bim, bada, bim, 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 bim.